So, I want to ask you all a question. Have you ever had something happen to you that truly, truly surprised you? Let's see, anybody out here in the sanctuary? Most of you have had some kind of surprises, maybe big or small. But I remember there was a surprise that I had a few years ago before I was here at Marvin. I attended a worship service, and the congregation, almost all of them, were from another country. They were from Liberia. And, you know, I felt pretty underdressed when I saw women there in their colorful and traditional dress and those beautiful head wraps. But that's not what surprised me about this service. You see, the songs were familiar, and, you know, there were prayers, and then there was the sermon that all seemed familiar. But there were a few differences. Something unexpected happened when it was time for the offering. Now, for me, until COVID time, in most worship services, we simply had someone come up and we passed the plates out in the pew. But that's not what happened here. Here, at this service that I attended, the offertory music started, and I looked around me, and row after row, person after person, was getting up, and they were walking down to the front with their collection, with their dollars, with their checks, with their ties. And I was kind of astounded by all of that. It's not what I expected. You know, they didn't just walk. They were dancing down the aisles. And it was so surprising to me because, you know, my practice had been personally for me and the churches where I had worshipped before, a very discreet, you just kind of slip your money in there, no big deal about it. So it seemed odd to me. This practice was so very, very different it was it was so filled with movement and it was it was joy it was joy you know the scripture talks about joyful giving and that sprang to my mind because i was seeing it there for the first time unfold in front of me second corinthians 9 7 through 8 says god loves a cheerful giver god has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything that you need, always and in everything, to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. Now, Naaman, in this passage today from Second Kings, I think he must have felt some kind of surprise when he was healed, but he was not healed in the way that he expected. Today's scripture lesson is shared with us via, um, well, I'll say it's a unique, maybe it's a surprising video. So see if you can follow the story here. This is the 36th episode in a Lego Star Wars Bible story series. This episode is how Naaman is healed of leprosy through Elisha. Ah! I'll give it you. Not you again. Yarg. Ah, come with me. I have a prisoner. Ah, ah, ah. Do 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 do. Victory! Honey, I'm home. Hello, dear. I brought you a new servant girl from Israel. I won her in war today. Oh, yay. No, no, no. The forks go over there. Okay. Why does Master's skin look so weird? He has leprosy. Oh. Hmm. You should ask the prophet of Israel. He could heal him. Hmm. I should tell him that. So there's a prophet in Israel that could heal me, you say? Hmm. Oh, name it. You are my best warrior. Thank you, my lord. Now, you have said to me that you wish to be healed of your leprosy. Yes, my lord. I hear of a prophet in Israel that could heal me. Hmm. Very well. Your wish shall be my command. I shall send a messenger at once. Thank you, my lord. What news do you bring? What? Be gone! Ah, that's a 
outrageous. What is outrageous, my lord? Ah, the king of Arab. He has a general with leprosy, and he wishes for me to heal him. Who does he think I am? God? <laughs> I cannot heal him. He is just start trying to start a fight with me. He just wants a war. He'll get one. Your Highness, send him to me. I shall heal him. Hmm. Not quite a war, but... Very well. Is this where the prophet lives? Yes, yes it is. And he says that you are to go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times. What? <coughs> Silly prophet. Master, what is the matter? Ah, uh, the prophet. I thought he would have waved his hand and healed me of my leprosy. What, do you think he is some sort of Jedi? Eh, maybe. But master... If you were to go and tell you to do something grand, would you not have done it? Yeah. Well then, why not go just wash yourself? That is simple enough. Hmm. You are right. Oh, here I go. Number one. <sighs> that makes seven. Ah! I am healed! Oh, thank you, Prophet. Thank you. I am healed. You're welcome. Please, please, accept some gifts. No, no. Now is not the time to accept gifts. Oh. Okay. Well, then, may I be forgiven if I have to worship with my king? Yes, you are forgiven. Now you may go. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Master was too kind. You should have accepted some money. Hmm. I know. <laughs> Naaman! Uh, what is it? What is it? Does a prophet need something? Uh, two men have come, and they need some clothes. And some money. Uh, would you be willing to give some for these men? Yes, yes, by all means. I shall give you some money and clothing for them. My men will accompany you and take them back with you. Oh, okay, okay. All right, well, let's go. <laughs> you can stay here now. You can go back to Naaman. I can go the rest of the way on my own. Okay, if you say so. Alright. <laughs> Hide it over here. No one will ever know. <laughs> Gehazi. Yes, Prophet? Where have you been? Uh, nowhere. You lie. Was my presence not with you when you went to go see Naaman? Uh, now is not the time to accept gifts and money. Oh. His leprosy will now cling to you. Mm. Mm. Huh? I'm white. I can still feel the bruises on my feet from the, all the Legos that I stepped on over the years. Who knew that I could have been using them in church to tell Bible stories, too? That's a better use, I think. And I hope that you followed along, but I'm going to fill in some of the cracks. You may want to go back and, and read this chapter um, later on in Second Kings, the whole chapter, to make sure you got the story. But let's take a closer look right now. It begins with Naaman. He's the guy that has leprosy. But he's also described as this heroic soldier. He's a general, but he has leprosy. Now, Naaman's country in bi biblical times was Aram. And when I was uh, trying out the sermon, I found that there were so many words that had A-M in them, Aram, Aramean, Naaman. I decided it might be clear to you if I call it what the region we know now. It's the region we now know as Syria. So I'm going to use that instead of the biblical term to help us keep it sorted out. Because this story has a lot of characters and a lot of things going on in it. Biblical texts don't often feature female characters. 
but one of the characters that we meet early on in this story, did you notice at the beginning, he takes a captive in war and brings this Israelite girl back as a slave for his wife. And then we meet the Syrian king, or hear what the Syrian king says, and the Israelite king, and the prophet Elisha, who is called a man of God. Now, at the time, what was going on, and you saw that with the, the little battle at the beginning, there was a lot of aggression between Syria and Israel, and Naaman's troops were cruel and violent, and they were just relentless in taking the Israelites' lives and their homes. So people feared and hated Naaman. So for the Syrian king to send a letter to the rival, to, um, to the monarchy of Israel, Naaman must have been very, very valuable to him. The Israelite king, on the other hand, I don't know if you caught that, but he thinks that Naaman is just coming to try to escalate hostilities, to cause more war. But it is Naaman's slaves, especially the slave girl that we meet in the beginning, who show compassion. And it's the man of God, it's the prophet Elisha, who agrees to heal his enemy. So Naaman is this complicated combination of this hero warrior, but he has leprosy, which means people would have shunned him and considered him an outsider. So Naaman goes at the direction of the slave girl to the prophet's house, and he gets a letter from his king to the, to the Israelite king, and he has some expectations in his mind. He thinks that Naaman will just wave his hands over him and poof, the leprosy will be gone. But that's not what happens. Now, the slave girl, why does she show that kind of compassion? Why would she care a whit for someone who had enslaved her. Then the Israelite king says, What am I, God? Neither he nor the Syrian king can heal Naaman. But the Israelite slave girl and the other slaves that we see in the story, people of the lowest possible social standing, they are the ones that point the way to healing. Now Naaman considers what the prophet has sent word for him to do to wash in the muddy, murky waters of the Jordan. Now there are, there are much cleaner waters, holy waters around, but he says the Jordan. And Elisha doesn't even come to speak to him beforehand. He sends a messenger. So Naaman is kind of in a huff about these directions until one of his slaves says, well, you'd have done it if it was a lot more difficult to be healed. Why don't you just go wash yourselves? So he does as he's directed, and after seven dips into the muddy Jordan, he is healed, and his skin is, is clear, and it looks like the complexion of someone much younger than him. Now, he wants to be generous because he's been healed, and he offers gifts. And then one of, uh, of the kings and Elisha's servants, he kind of conspires to get some gifts from him and hide them, and what happens to him? Well, he gets cursed with leprosy, just like Naaman had been at the beginning of the story. So, so far it seems that enemies can be transformed by healing grace, and insiders can be as wicked as any enemy. Naaman, even cruel Naaman, is worthy of healing and kindness and care. And even the slaves, the people who have been horribly mistreated, who have been imprisoned, had been relegated to a life of servitude, even they are able to be used by God to offer grace and compassion. Now this story is one that Jesus would have grown up hearing, and it's evident in his teachings because in Luke 4, Jesus uses the example of God's expansive and inclusive love when he talks about Naaman's story. Then later on in Luke, in Luke 7, he heals the Roman centurion slave. And you know, that would have been another enemy of Israel. Then yet another centurion from Rome recognizes the innocence of Jesus at the cross. And a third centurion, well, he becomes the first Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit. That we read about that in Acts 10. 
so you all remember my surprise at the worship service I described at the beginning of the sermon. What surprised me? Well, it was the transformation of something that's typically mundane, just a regular part of the service, the offering. Like Naaman in our scripture, this is not how I thought things would go. I thought I might be moved by the sermon or the special music, not the offering. The helpers in Naaman's story were not who he or we would expect. It was through people who had every reason to hate him. Those are the ones that showed up for him and guided him and healed him. The healing itself was not Elisha doing a magic trick, waving his hands over him, but it was through an act of simple obedience. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. So what could we learn from this? Well, perhaps that God works in surprising ways. That even those we despise, those who have done wicked things in our sight, well, they're God's creation, worthy of love and forgiveness and healing. God uses, again, the most unlikely people to share the good news of God's grace. The slaves in the story, especially that unnamed Israelite girl, well, they offer compassion. And they give Naaman the opportunity to find healing and peace. So I want you to think about this when you think that this little country church of ours, when you think that we can't do big things for God's kingdom, and when you think that maybe you cannot be used by God for actions, and words bigger than what people expect. Remember this story and remember who caused God's compassion and grace to be shown in the world. We see in the story enemies that cross boundaries, human-made boundaries, in search of wholeness. And we see the surprising results when those boundaries seem to no longer matter, when compassion and care go beyond what we expect. Even with those that we don't agree with and those we may not even like, let alone love, they're made in the image of God. Like it or not, they're our siblings. And ready or not, God can do big things through regular folks like us. For you see, that's the power. That's the power of love. As we love God, and because we love God, we can and do love all of God's creation. What a wonderful surprise to be able to love and serve and even do ministry that is much bigger than anyone could ever imagine. A modern prophet sums it up like this. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Amen.